Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, and welcome to a new series on Bury Sheet. And for today's class, I don't think it's going to happen every week, but for today's class, I just wanted to have the text, the text alone with, with no commentaries. I will bring in things as they come up. But for today's class, I think the text itself is so powerful that I'd like to just read through the text almost with fresh eyes as if you've never learned anything before. Ask any questions you want, within reason, John, <laughs> within reason. <laughs> and uh, we can try to push the dial on what we want to understand in uh, in this text. So I've given you translation, but I want to explain and express that I've told you many times before. Translation fundamentally is always interpretation. So understanding which translation you use is going to be fundamental in how we understand text. For example, the very first line of the Torah, which we're going to see here, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz, most of you know is, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But if you have a look at the translation I have given you, it says, when God began to create heaven and earth, this is what happened. What is the difference between those two translations? in the beginning and when God began. What would you say? What is the difference between those translations? And it's not just being pedantic. Esther. When God began, it means that Hashem was there before and who knows what else was there before. Good. In the beginning sounds like it all was. Like that, that, was the beginning. that was the beginning. When when God began implies that God could have been doing other things before God decided to work on Project Earth, Project Universe. Okay, it implies that there was life, maybe even worlds before this one. According to Midrash, there were 976 generations or worlds before this one okay which means god created destroyed created destroyed created destroyed created destroyed until he sat down with this one okay so understanding when god began is telling me here is god began this project but it doesn't give me any information what happened before and guess what that's not our purpose. Most of the, you know, often the questions people love to ask me, what's life gonna be like when we die? What happened before the world was created? You know what? I got nada, I got nothing for you. I don't know. It doesn't mean that there isn't anything written on it. It means until you've been there, you don't know what's gonna happen after we die. And guess what? Until you can ask God, no one knows what was here before God decided to create. All that notwithstanding, the Torah does tell us the land was this phrase here, tohu vavohu. And the translation I've given you there is unformed and void. With darkness over the surface of the deep. Elohim and there was a spirit or a wind from God sweeping over the water. And I just want to try and understand what are we talking about here? Like before God did anything, the world was unformed and void. And there was darkness over the surface of the deep and a wind from God sweeping over the water. So what's this water? So good. Before God created the world, 
there was already stuff in existence. Which sounds, again, again, I don't want to be a heretic on my first lesson here. So, John, you're in good company. You don't want, you want to be careful here, which is we believe in Judaism of yesh me'ayin, or ex nihil, that God created from nothing. This verses imply that what? At the beginning, when God began to create, there already was matter. What matter was there? And is it an exact translation because it's darkness over the surface of the deep, mm -hmm. but deep is not tangible, so it's the surface of something intangible. Correct. So, so I, I, exact translation? I agree with you that you've got some vagueness in those parts, but the Mayan, the water, everyone knows what water is. Okay. H2O, we know it chemically, we know it <laughs> physically. It's a liquid, can be, uh, can be a solid one frozen, you can even make it into a gas. We know what it is, okay? We know what water is. How was that there before God creates? What is tohu vavohu, unformed and void? Is that Antimatter, matter, well, we, I don't know what it is. And this darkness over the surface of the deep. That's a good translation. Let's, let's go with it. It's an okay translation. I, I, I quite like it. That's why I chose it. It's not terrible. It's very hard to translate ambiguous terms. So, you know, there are some words like Vayomer, and he said, Vaidaber, and he spoke. Very easy. Okay. But when it's giving me tohu vavohu, chaos is a good description. You know, it's hard to really go through what that is. But what I want you to explain here is, I'm reading that verse verse, and it's saying there was water there. But it might not have been organized water, like on lake and ocean. It could have just been water. I know, but still. But when you think of yesh me'ayin, of God creating from nothing, I'm expecting there to be a black space. I don't know why, why but my mind goes to uh, a Hollywood uh, theme. It's a complete black spot. I mean, I'm in, uh, maybe I'm in a blue, a blue screen or a green screen. There's just nothing there. This description seems to be the something there. There's a spirit of God or a wind of God. There's water. There's some element there. There's something tangible there, which again, this is why I like studying things like this without commentary, because otherwise you're like, well, there's what's well, that, because that's what Rashi is driving you towards. Rashi doesn't ask this question, okay? One of the things which is fun about studying without commentary is, you don't get bothered by their questions. You get bothered by what are your questions. I've given you a title here of six or seven days of creation. You're probably not going to get anywhere near that question because it's, a, it's going to be at the end of the packet. It's probably going to be next week or next month. Right now, we have unanswered questions. And the question is, what do you do with unanswered questions? You're like, okay, the bell's gone. I'm free, don't worry about it. The rabbi is going to start something new next week. Or are there questions which we grapple with, that we think about, which stay with us? And I want to try and come to a resolution of it. Now, I'll be honest, this is not a major question for me. And the reason why it's not a major question for me is because of what I said at the beginning. It's what happened before God created the universe. And so, therefore, the only person, the only being who can tell me what that is, is God, and God's not speaking to me right now. So after 120, I can ask that question, and God can tell me. But right now, it's not. But if it is a burning question for you, how would you answer it if you've been told in the classical texts that God created from nothing? Here I have wind, and I have water, and I have something which I can't put my finger on which is unformed and void. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems like the, I, 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 I'm operating as I read it with the idea that this is, this is the first piece of creation. So before this, there was nothing. And then the, 
initial act of creation was whatever this is. So the first pasuk, prior, prior to the first pasuk, there's nothing. There was nothing before that, but now it's nilo that now it talks about what the first moment post creation was like. Of the, okay, so you want to say pasuk bet is already creation. Okay, that's the action. The first thing that God does is create chaos, and what God is in charge of is then taking that chaos. And over the span of six or seven days, making some form of order. Can I ask, uh, John, absolutely, on, please. please. But who's the observer that's recording this? Because if you talk about translations and all, it's important to know who the, who the author of this is. Good. So according to tradition, this is Moses is being is is, is the scribe. And God is dictating to him on the mountain, and he is recounting to God is recounting to Moses what creation looked like. And God talks in the, in the second person. Mm -hmm. In this stage, and then you got a whole discussion about the book of Devarim of Deuteronomy, where it's I did this, I did that, where Moses is is the. Uh, is, is recounting his story at the end. But the first four books, God is dictating and Moses is described. And Moshe is the, is, is the sofer. But to me, it's odd that God would do that. Mm -hmm. you, you'd wanted to say I. Well, if, if Moses is, is described mm -hmm. of God, then I would expect it to say I. Mm -hmm. Or he just translated it himself. You would expect that, absolutely. Well, John, I appreciate it because it's not, it's not like we're devoid of, of places where God directly does say, you know, does say I am. And so why there and not here? Why not, not, why not first person the, the whole thing? It's a very mm -hmm. interesting question. I mean, that's a fascinating question, which we're going to see. And a lot of this where, where you would expect God to take center stage, he kind of takes a very, uh, our rabbis and commentators try to imply a humble spot where he's like, let us make man, not let me make man. What do you mean let us make man? Again, you can talk about who the other people or, beings are involved it's definitely not multiple gods but perhaps it's the royal we perhaps it's angels but there's definitely a hint of here of where is god in this story he's there because god speaks he, he has utterances but in that very beginning he's not even the subject of the verse in the beginning god created or when god began it's not god began it's when like it's it's already he doesn't want to be the subject of the sentence he doesn't want to be the first thing out of it it's almost like we need to learn from god that kind of concept i give thanks before you rather than is uh instead of saying i give thanks it's modani which is doesn't work in the english but in the hebrew the first thing which comes out of my mouth is thanks i give not mm -hmm. I give thanks. The first thing word comes out of me should not be ani, should not be me. So we're learning that from God. The first word in the Torah is not Elohim, it's not Adonai, it's not Yud Kevavke, it is just the Reshit. The subject is creation. The subject mm -hmm. is not God. Mm -hmm. Life is not about me is what God is telling us. And it's something, this is a, a, a classic lesson. Now, I'm hearing from lots of people in the room, anyone on Zoom, this is a new class, a new series, where mm -hmm. I'm happy to be the guide and uh, uh, give lots of solo commentary, but I want you to feel free to unmute and share your opinions. I have a, I just- Yes, Ross. It, it does seem um, in this first verse that, 
that God's create that there that there was creation before His creation of heaven and earth. So you like my interpretation, Ross? You like that that, uh, that perhaps God before God created the world, He created something else to use in that blueprint. Whereas we had yeah. Jeff's position, which was no sentence number one. That's your title. Verse two is ver, ver, verse two is okay. He's already started the creation piece. The reason why I think Ross is correct, other than it's like my idea, sorry, Jeff, <laughs> is because verse three begins with Vayomer, the God said, okay, and that life is all about in this creation. It's words cause action, okay? That God is showing us the power of speech. Through his words, God causes things to come up. So, Roz, I love it. Not only because it's like me, but because it fits <laughs> into all of those pieces. Jeff, come defend yourself. <laughs> what would you like to say? By the way, there's a, a wonderful room of, uh, of people here. And we have a wonderful room on Zoom as well. It's wonderful to see so many of us here. I think we've got nine here and we've got uh, eight on Zoom with us. So wonderful to have so many people from Florida, East Coast, and we've got Israel. So a lot of people all over. So Jeff, what would you say? We have Israel. What time is the Israel? Right now, I think it's uh, 8.20 in the evening. All right, what would you say? Well, I mean, I, would, I, I could say that the that all of the following biomers that come for all of the various stages of creation could be the could be the continuous uh, redefinition in the actual moment of that kind of creation was was in the first pasuk. So all of the matter of the universe was created in the first pasuk. And that in the second pasuk it defines what the state of the universe was after its ex nihil of creation. And then God said, okay, now I've got my palette. Now I'm going to take my palette, brush mm -hmm. one, I'm going to make light, I'm going to make darkness, and go from there. I love it. And this is what I want you to understand in this class also. And that is, there is no one answer. Okay, we have this concept of shivim panim la Torah, that there are 70 facets to the Torah. Means there are 70 ways to interpret it. Now be careful you don't do 71 or 72. Okay, so you can't bring in crazy stories and say it's one of my interpretations, it's classic. No, uh, it has to fit a little bit. So if it's, uh, I like it, no, it has to not, no, I like it, but if it's within certain parameters, and these parameters are very, very wide. I would say that your interpretation can be shiv in panim mitzorah, can be one of the 70. If it's way mm -hmm. out there, it's way out there. So I think what you're saying there, Jeff, although it's not the way that Roz and I were going, is totally a legitimate position. Here is all the building blocks being created in verse two, and then the rest of the chapter is going to break down the rest of the creation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Esther. Rabbi? Rabbi, one second, one, one second, Donna. Just taking. We had oh, a okay. hand. I don't know if you heard me or not. Sorry. So some of some of you may have been in the shiur mm -hmm. about the about the mabul with Rabbi Miners when he went, and that gives a hint. They they analyze, uh, and it kind of goes to what to what Jeff was saying. Hashem in, in creation, he separates, he differentiates, and and before the mabul. Breaks down everything again, so that's back to you. And they, they, whoever did it, I can't remember the name of the, of the organization, but it was fascinating. If you compare what happened to the, the water and to the animals and to everything, it was deconstruction, undifferentiation, back to chaos. So, I'm sure I love that. That's another great idea. I mean, that. Understanding that to build up, break down, build up, break down, and that's just doing that. And it's much easier to destroy than to build, and uh, all that's coming up. Donna, what's your question or comment? Okay. Um, I was just thinking when you said just a little earlier about we make man, 
it makes me think that um, there's some responsibility for for mankind to actually develop himself because we make men, we make our 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 our, our character. I, I don't know. It just made me think of that. What do you think of that idea? I think that's a wonderful idea, and we see that even more. Uh, throughout Bereshit, specifically in the fifth chapter, it says that uh, God created man uh, in his own image, male and female, he created them. And there, uh, I think it's the Ramban, but uh, don't quote me on that, but we'll, we'll see it when we get to those comments. But uh, the Ramban says that Adam was the only person both male and female created by God. But after that, God gave us the ability by blessing us to have children. And that's where that role of let us make man, that interpretation mm -hmm. comes in, which is, yes, God formed man. But after that, we are partners in God with creation. And that's the, the, uh, the Talmud says that there are three partners in creation, man, woman, and God. So every, we have three parents. We often think we have two. But really, we have three. God is our parents as well, and that we are partners in that. So a beautiful comment, Donna. I like that. So let's jump into this section here on day one. Okay? Can I just have a question? Yeah, what sure. What about the, the tenth? Because I keep seeing like, we're really people about looking at this line like that. So I was like, that's how we will and that's like past tense. Mm -hmm. And then it goes, the first of all, the home, the roof, the team, the rafafet, which is already present. Present. All to So it could be like two different parts. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing. The first sentence so first was is past. Oh, first was past. Then. So the Mayan wouldn't even come into class. It's like another part. Then there was Hoshef and there was Mayan. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like, you know how we talk about, and again, we can get into this a little bit, which is. I don't know how much everyone knows, doesn't know. Chapter one of Murray Sheets of Genesis and chapter two, are they complementary stories or are they arguing on how the creation story took place? So we're gonna get and see that. Here, from what you're saying, is that in a microcosm, in that verse, is that two competing events mm -hmm. for what's going on? Is Pastuk Bet, and the land or the earth was chaos or it was unformed and void with darkness over it. Is, and then the and then you've got the, the, the wind hover God is hovering over the depths and of the water and all that. Is that a separate item? And so therefore is Pasuk Bet taking that uh, challenge that we have of is that Perak Aleph and Perak Bet? Chapter one, chapter two, fighting for what really happened. Or do we read it the way that Jeff said? It's just everything happened in that pasuk, and then we're going to delineate it. Or we're going to go with, which I think you might be hinting at, which is what we said before, perhaps saying there was things which were existing before God created the world, that there were worlds beforehand, and there was these things. and creation was making order of chaos. Okay, so I'm not trying to be vague. I'm not trying to evade. I'm deliberately suggesting multiple interpretations. And this is just a different way of understanding. I remember when I first started learning Kumash in depth and trying, there was always these rabbis who would try to, can I fulfill every position? He have in halacha as well. Can I fulfill all the positions? The Mishnah Burura is the bottom line halacha in Ashkenazic position. He loves to fulfill all the positions of the rabbis that came before him. You also have the Aruch HaShulchan who says, no, the halacha is like the last one or like this one. So you can have it that we can try and resolve all our commentaries that they all fit together beautifully. Or we can say, you know what? There are multiple ways to understand it, and they don't, they can be mutually exclusive, and they can even contradict each other. We're going by, this is one way to interpret it, there's another way to interpret it. If you can come up and say, here's a way which explains them both, fine. 
but it's not necessary, okay? And just be comfortable knowing, especially in this section on Bereshit, I'm not giving you an answer. I'm giving you answers. I'm giving you possible solutions, but mainly I want to develop with you questions and I want you to sit with them and meld with them. It could be you want to email me during the week or have a grab a coffee with me and discuss it more. What's interesting here? What's going on? It's not going to be Rabbi Hassan has resolved Perakalif or Bereshit. Here is the definitive answer for what exactly happened on each one, why it happened, what it means, where it didn't know. Perakalif is the most ambiguous chapter known to human literature. And I want to tell you one more thing, which is uh, something which uh, I'm uh, you are the beneficiaries of the fact that I'm teaching a class on Bereshit at Northwest Yeshiva High School, and I'm teaching the freshmen there. And I said to them, what are your questions on Bereshit? And the, one of the fundamental questions you're going to get from teenagers is, how does this fit with science? How does creation story fit with science? And my answer, sitting down or on one foot, is science is how. The Torah is why. We are learning why. We're not learning how. So if you're reading the Bereshit story of chapter one, even chapter two, and you're like, okay, now I've got my timeline, and this is exactly how old the universe is, and this is how things work. Well, guess what? The sun is created on day four. So t tell me what a day is. A day, how can you have a 24-hour period if the sun is created on day four? It's not there. The Torah is not telling me how the world was created. It's telling me why. And what is the why? The why is God created this universe. God created humanity. And we have a purpose. And that's how it begins. It's not answering how did it come about. Okay? Why? Probably because the Torah is written in the language that human beings can understand, specifically the human beings who were created 3,300 years ago, who received it, not, sorry, not those, not Adam and Chava, but the humans who received the Torah, who were slaves in Egypt. The ancient Israelites 3,300 years ago had a certain knowledge and certain reference points. So the Torah story is understandable to, the creation story is understandable to them. It's cryptic to them. And it's, stand, it's, un, it's understandable to us. And it's cryptic to us. And we, our job is to try to explain it. Now again, how you resolve Torah and science you can say they're completely opposite spheres and never let the two mix in polite society. Or you can say, no, one is the how and one is the why, and they're not arguing with one another. One is telling Rabbi. Yourself... Sorry? Rabbi? Yes, can mother. Yes, Rabbi. Just wanted to say this, that we know that the oldest rocks on earth are the Vashti Schists, which can be seen at the Grand Canyon. And it has been posited that they are approximately 6 billion years old. And we are going to, for the purposes of this discussion, regard 1 billion years as being one day. Yes, that's definitely one way to understand it. When it comes to a day in the life of God, even the King David in Psalm says, a day to God is like a thousand years. You could easily say a day to God is like a billion years, 100%. Uh, the ancient, not the ancient, but the Kabbalists of the Middle Ages already posited uh, in their now not very uh, accurate calculations that the universe is 15.2 billion years off, so a little off by, uh, uh, by, by 100,000 million years. But, Pretty close, give or take. But the whether the world is whether the earth is 4.3 or it's six billion years old, the the Torah, when it doesn't make sense, 
in a literal sense, it has to be understood metaphorically. I'm not saying that as a 21st century uh, rabbi with a, with, a bio, with a biology degree who wrote his thesis on trying to understand all of this together. No, I'm talking to you as quoting the Rambam. Maimonides, who lived 800 years ago, says that. If the Torah doesn't make sense literally, it has to be understood metaphorically. So Judaism does not believe that you have to understand the story of the creation of six days being to six 24-hour periods. Now, there are Jews who believe that. There are Christians who believe that, but it doesn't have to be. We don't live in that world. And I won't say anyone who believes that 24-hour periods is wrong, because I think, you know, they have what to rely on to say that. But I think it's far easier to express it that these are six days, that each of these days are not 24-hour periods. They could be billion years, as my mother said, or they could be epochs, whatever, the stages, but it doesn't need to be 24-hour units. So let's look at the first day, okay? So it's uh, depending what package you have. Uh, for mine, I got them side by side, so maybe you have them top to bottom. But wherever it says day one, have a look at day one. And it says as follows Vayome Elohim Yehi Or, Vahi Or. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Vayar Elohim et Or Kitab. And God saw that the light was good. Vayadel Elohim Bena Or Ben Hachosha. And God separated between the light and between the darkness. Right? And God called the light day, and the night he called, sorry, in the darkness he called night. And it was evening and it was morning on the first day. So the question on here is. What was good about the light? What did God see that light was good compared to darkness? And then the second question is a little more straightforward. When does a Jewish day begin? You all know, why does uh, uh, Shabbat begin on Friday night? Because that's where we start. We start the night. The holiday begins, the holidays, Shabbat, everything begins night, follows day. Why? By air, by okay, it was evening, it was morning. Okay, so it's telling you in Jewish days we begin with the night and the day follows the night rather than the night following the day. But what is it, the more fundamental question, what did God see in the light that the light was good? I don't know, it's just so obvious. Why is it obvious? What is it that we, why is it that we like light so much? Why is it that we get depressed in Seattle? November to March, uh, and then we get so excited on, on, on Shabbat and Sunday, oh, blue skies, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. But when it's dark, like, why, why do we have such a negative association with dark? Why, why light is so positive? Why is it good? We can live light in the dark, in, in the light, whereas when it's dark, if there's no electricity, all you can do is sleep. <laughs> Okay, if you, you'll be less productive. I, I love it. God could see it was good because light allows for creativity. Roz? Um, I was also thinking it's uh, light is uh, illuminating. It illuminates what he's creating. It brings it to our to the awareness and sort of a spiritual, from a spiritual perspective, awareness. Rabbi? I, I love that idea. Donna? When there's light, we can see things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So like, 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 like what Elise said, absolutely. And it allows you by able to see, to be able to be doing, to be able to be productive. I like that idea from, from, from Roz, that we're not only does it allow you to see, but it illuminates. It makes it even better. Uh, Rubisa, you look like you had something to share on that one, that the light was good. You're like nodding at me there. He could have just no, been saying hello. Really, mm -hmm. No, I was nodding whatever everyone was saying because it is an interesting question. Like it feels obvious. Like, well, why do you have to ask? But then when you really try to articulate into words, 
what is the value of light? It's much trickier than I thought. I was just really nodding in, in hope of hearing everyone's profound thoughts on it. Rabbi? Yeah. When I, and, when, and when I use the term see things, I don't just mean physical things. I mean, it helps us to see the non-physical, the spiritual also. Mm. Oh, that, that, that's very profound, Donna. I like that a lot. Thank you. So I, I want to try and get here, which is I put questions on this sheet, which, again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I wanted to really explain what is happening in this Bereshit class, which is different to any other class I would give on Humash. I don't have an answer. I really don't. Like, what is it about light that's good is intrinsically I know that that's true. But I can't tell you and everything which everyone is saying is true, but I don't have an answer on it. You know, I can answer the second question, what, when does a Jewish day begin? That's easy. Because it's, because it's, it's, it's either one or the other. But here, and what I'm saying to you is, there are questions where, do you want to plumb the depths to realize and seek out wisdom into what's going on? Esther. Well, the other thing, two things about this is that we know from the first passage that darkness existed. So this is the first differentiation. This is, and so that in itself is good. And now I'm going back to, I don't know, when I was six years old, it never bothered me. How was there light and darkness day and night before the sun and the moon? Ah, oh, you go, here you go, Esther. Where is the sun? Where is the significance of all the light coming from? What is that light source? This is what's known as the Orhaganuz, the hidden light. There was light, at the beginning of creation, which, according to our tradition, was hidden, put away. And it's going to be something which is only appreciated by the righteous in the world to come, by the tzaddikim and olam haba. There are many things which are hidden because we don't want them falling into the wrong hand. God did not want this primordial light to be used by the wicked, so it was put away. But that would answer the question of what was the light if sun was only created on day four, okay? But, right. Yes, Rubisa. If the sequence of events as described in the Torah would not be how I as a human would logically perceive the sequence of events, it would be either first um, by Abdel, first they were separated the light from the dark, mm -hmm. or, and then Hashem would see it was good, or he says there was light and then he saw it was good, but what's the separation that is then happening if the light has already been created? So that's an even more powerful question, which is, he, God saw that it was good, before its separation. So even when it was commingled in the darkness, even before it was even formed, perhaps, God knew that that light, its properties, whatever it was, was in its essence true. And that's something which is beyond us, which is, can you see the goodness in something before it has become manifest? That's godliness, okay? God can see before something comes into the world. Jeff. Well, I think it's, I mean, I appreciate the question because it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's because if you read it a little bit, you could read it as God saw that it was good. And then the first thing that God does to react to that is change it. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, I mean, so you could look at it from other, you know, either edge. Uh, 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 and I can resist also the temptation to suggest is, you know, we have two ideas of matter in the universe, at least current scientific thinking, light matter and dark matter. And so it's easy potentially to see that when you stand back, you see matter. And then Hashem stood back and you'll forgive the physical, physical, physicality of it, that God stood back and saw from a distance the concept of matter. And then and separating them and creating 
light and dark or whatever that is. that that's a that's a two different kinds of matter that clearly seem to exist scientifically in our universe. I'm glad that you're mentioning that Jeff because there's a beautiful book which I read when I was I want to say 19 I was uh I just got back from my uh year in Israel and I was studying biology and uh I don't know why but this whatever it was this 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 parasha was bothering me and there was a lecturer coming through Manchester and his name was Natanavi Ezer and he was a physicist and he was trying to explain from pure physics how to explain creation from a scientific perspective and he has two books one is called fossils and faith and the other one is called in the beginning Natan Aviezer and he goes through and explains from a scientific perspective how these six stages not six days but six stages work and I think that first day I think he's going again it was fundamental, but half a lifetime we, away. Ago. We went so. to hear him. We all went to hear him and we bought the books. See, there we go. Mm -hmm. right. Rabbi, uh, my, my, my parents are quite taken with it as well. Yes, Ross. Yeah, yeah. I was, as I read this part, um, it makes me think that, so God thought that light was good and then decided to make it permanent introduces the concept i think in a way of permanence that it's let there be light but then it's going to be now day versus night on a regular consistent permanent schedule absolutely so and that understanding that in order to appreciate the good i have to have the bad which is yeah. How do I know what light is? I don't have the opposite. So I need the choshech to appreciate yeah. the light. But guess what? God is the creator of the light and the dark. God is the creator of the good and the evil. We say in the, in the morning, we say the bracha before the shama, yotze or muvari choshech, or se shalom, that God created light, God created darkness, God created shalom, peace, and he also created everything. That's a euphemistic beracha. The true verse actually comes from Isaiah, which says that God created evil. Okay? God created everything in this world that we have God created. God didn't create just fluffy bunnies and nice things. Okay? It wasn't God created just the light. God created the dark. God didn't just create good. There's also bad. There's evil in this world. There are not just, you know, there are negatives in the world that we live in. And the point is that we have, we need to have the opposites in order to appreciate the other extremes. And to realize that even negatives can be positives. We can take those things, that we can use them to propel us forward. So we can't just be, I believe in a God who created light. No, not so in Judaism. The same God who created light also created darkness. And there is life in the dark and there is faith in darkness. There is faith in challenges, faith in difficult times, more so sometimes and more fundamentally sometimes than when everything is light and good and wonderful. Yes, Roz. Oh, just one more quick point that, so it seems to me that, so then light uh, also illuminates the darkness for us. Yeah, that goes back to your interpretation that they, they it's not just the opposite. Right, it can actually you back. can I'm help you in the dark. Okay, hi. All right. All right, so that's day one. Any other questions on day one? Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to try in the few minutes that we have left to try to go through day two. And if we don't finish it, we'll pick it up next time. But I just want to, I don't want to stop now. I want to, go, I want to go a little bit further and have a look at day two. Day two says as follows. Let there be a 
rakia. A firmament is normally the translation. And I've given you expanse. I even know what that means. <laughs> in the midst of the water. Vihi mavdil bein mayim lemayim. And it will be able to separate between the waters and the waters. Vayas Elohim et And God made this expanse or firmament. Vayavdel. And he separated bein hamayim asher matachat l'rakia. He said between the waters that were above the firmament. Sorry, those which were under the firmament, and the waters which were above this expanse of firmament, and it was so. And God called this expanse or this firm stuff, sky or heavens. And it was evening and it was morning, a second day. Is day two a good day? It doesn't say. Monday, it's just another manic Monday. No, it's Mondays aren't good. You know how people don't like Mondays because they've got to go back to work? You know why we don't like Mondays? Because there's no tov. There's no good. There's no good. Monday isn't good. Why is Monday not good? It's all about separating. It separates me from my Sunday, which I wanted. No, it separates, but there's no completion. Day one, God creates and completes. Day two is an incomplete form of creation. If you have, and then just to skip forward to day three, which we'll look at more next time, you have the word tov twice. And that's why we say to people, what's a good day to get married? Tuesday, because it's pa'amayin ki tov, because God said it was good twice. Okay, so Tuesday is a great day. Most of us, Monday, we're all depressed. Tuesday, ah, wonderful. And it's because we're all Torah scholars and we know that Monday, there's no good, but Tuesday has got a double portion of good. But what's going on on that day? God is some kind of firmament expanse. He's separating upper waters, lower waters. But that was a mystery. That's even harder to understand. than the, the, I put that back up there with verse two. Of, I don't know what's going on here. God is hovering over the waters. It's similar to God is separating the waters, the upper and the lower. I don't know what's happening there. Does anyone have any uh, idea what's going on? Why does the water is in the form of, I'm sorry, of no, no. clouds already? <laughs> so it could be sky and it could be clouds. And it's telling me how evaporation works and how rain clouds come down and kind of forms down the rain and then it forms rivers and lakes and it goes back up again through evaporation and then clouds and rain. But I want to think there's more to it. And I'm not saying it's not only that, but I, I'd hope there's more. Well, light and dark really helps us. We can see light and dark, the good mm -hmm. and the bad, the good and the evil. This is like, we already have the water, that's fine. But we don't, you know, it, it's not a big deal to us because we don't see the benefit of it. See, I, I don't know. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but like today, my drive along the lake, it's gorgeous. And what makes the lake so gorgeous, right? It's watching the gradients. I don't know exactly what's happening here, exactly what Shem is creating, but when the lake is beautiful, what makes it beautiful? Watching it going from the depths of the water up that like, I mean, like the steam on top and then coming up into the sky and what that gradient looks like is deeply awesome. So oh, I, love, I love it when it's glassy. No, it's, yeah, beautiful, it's beautiful, but it's yeah. not really helping us. You know, all the other, all the other creations are helping us. This is pretty. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so like you're saying it. this doesn't help because you don't see what's happening in the... Uh, you don't see what's happening in the what's it called in in the in the you, you don't see the firmament you don't see the sky or you don't see right, the heavens. Right. 
So God's creating something which is not for my, and maybe that's why it's not good because it's not for my instant use. Absolutely, Rabbi Hassan, I have a different opinion of that. Yeah, but compare it to the. One second, Rob. One second. Yeah, just want to hear from Rob, and then uh, we'll take it back to hear from Esther. Yes, Rob. So we we see this word. uh, It's like it's like havdala. This this uh, have. uh, this word separation several times in, in, mm-hmm. on this day. And when you have the separations, it, it creates space. It just, there's a, which involves boundaries, you know, that, that uh, before this, there was just this limitless mass of water. Now there's, now there's space. And, and you know, we, that's what we need as, as, as living beings. It was, it was definitely creating something for us. It was, it, it was a, a physical location for us to exist in. So I like that, and I think that's true. Havdalah, separation is essential to distinguish between light and dark, distinguish between day and night, distinguish between Shabbat and weekdays, lots of things like that. But if that's the case, I would want it to say that when God separated it, that it would be good. Why well, is it not good at this stage if he's already made the separation? Well, because there was nothing really created, you know, when you... you All he's doing is moving things around. The right, water's right, already right. there. Okay. No. You know, when you're like, oh, look, I did this project. And you're like, no, you just moved a bunch of things around. You didn't create anything. That's what I was... Oh, come on, that's good. I love all that's it. good organization. <laughs> <laughs> I organized that drawer, it was wonderful. <laughs> that drawer looks great right now, by the way. Yeah, uh, I don't know. All right, it's an interesting point. I, uh, I want us to stop here, but I want you to. This is a go- I'm giving you a sense of this class of what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this for the next few weeks as we navigate Perak Aleph and Perak Bet, which are very, very esoteric. Perak Gimel deals with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, gonna be tough as well. After we get past there, maybe we'll start trying to understand things a bit more. There'll be more commentaries and everything else, but right now, For the first three, four weeks, it's going to be like this, very open-ended. I want to hear from you. I want to share our vulnerabilities together as we read the text anew. So the homework is not to see how many translations of commentaries you can read and great essays on any of this. Just read the text and come up with your own ideas. No one can bring, I heard this, because I'll always bring that. You're only, you're only allowed to think, oh, I was reading this, and I just thought, and it didn't bother me before, what else I could do? And that's it. So hopefully we'll see you all again next week.